Welcome to Think Big with Dan and Kasim. Join host Dan Melnick and Kasim Masood as they explore big ideas, limitless possibilities, and engage with visionaries, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders who dare to dream big, get inspired, motivated, and find practical tips for personal growth. Think big, dream bigger, and ignite your potential. All right, welcome to Think Big with Dan and Kasim, and our guest today is David. So, David, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, tell us where you live and what you do for a living. Hey, absolutely. So, David Wolf is my name, spelled like the animal, W-O-L-F. I uh, was born and raised in Chicago. Myself and my team and my company are all located in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I've been out here eh, roughly about 20 years or so. So, can you just tell us exactly what you do and you know what's your company? So, the current state of affairs is about five years ago, I formed a company called Audavita studios. We are a production house, but we're entirely virtual and always have been. So what I mean by that is we produce audiobooks and podcasts. So the business is really kind of twofold. Those are our two major business lines. And um, we have discrete teams that produce each of those things, but there are some common infrastructures that are shared, of course, as any, you'd think with any business. Plus there's cross-pollination between our team because we're dealing with audio and video editing uh, and production. So there's some crossover, but uh, that's the essence of it. We produce about 200 audiobooks a year. And we work with publishers and authors all over the world, mostly in North America. And then we have um, publishing partners, uh, or some of them are hybrid publishers. Some of them are more traditional. Some of them are publishing service providers that provide services for authors that are, you know they go through the journey and now they need an audiobook version on Audible, Amazon, Apple, and all the rest. So we help those authors, uh, the clients of those companies, get that accomplished for them. So. Awesome. So how did you get the idea to start this company? So, you know, it's unlike a lot of startups and we're like kind of a five-year-old startup, unlike a lot of startups, um, my career led me to this. So here's what I mean. So uh, taking you back to uh, Chicago, which is where I was born and raised, I was a, started as a drummer. I was a musician. I started as a drummer and then later a keyboard player. And, and then eventually determined that I wanted to make money as a musician. And you really can't do that spectacularly as a freelance player. So I started to learn how to compose and write music for radio, TV, and film. And so I'm condensing many years, but I learned the business in Chicago, learned and uh, started working with advertising agencies and clients. And eventually, after I got married in 1985, moved to Dallas, Texas, which was a good market for me. I was about 26 years old at the time. I set up shop with a company called Cry Wolf Music. And we had a physical studio and I was writing the music and uh, my wife ultimately joined me and we built a small uh, office team, but mostly used freelance musicians and singers as most of these companies do. And we were a vendor to the advertising music, well, advertising um industry. So if um, McDonald's needed a regional spot, they would send me the video and I would score music to the video. If such and such needed a song, uh, we worked on a lot of cool stuff. We worked on a lot of PepsiCo, a lot of Frito-Lay, uh, Southwest Airlines, Embassy Suites Hotels. We did. Uh, I worked on children's programming like Chuck E. Cheese Restaurants International, and you guys probably know about those. We were doing the the, the pre-records for those animatronics that they, I don't know if they still use those, but- No, they got rid so of it was, them. It was, for, it was for the, they did get rid of them finally. So the, I live the, in the Dallas, whole, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the whole, so the whole um, infrastructure, we were doing it for the whole franchise. So it was actually an international thing. Uh, they were terrific clients. So most of it was advertising, but we did venture outside of that a little bit into the children's world for whatever reason. And so just to get back to your question, so I have a, a solid background in production. And, and when I turned 40, it was just time for a break. So I took a break. I closed down shop. It's more involved than that, but that's the short of it. And uh, came to New Mexico to help my brother restart a bakery business that had been uh, basically it had blown up like many businesses do. It was started by a cousin of ours. And he called me while I was still in Dallas and said, hey, do you want to you want to make uh, bagels? So we... Uh, I know, right? So we went out to we went out to Albuquerque. I brought my family out here. My kids were young; they were like three and five years old, roughly. And uh, his wife and he and my wife and me bought the assets out of bankruptcy and and redeployed this brand, which was largely retail before we got there. But so we leaned into the wholesale side of it because it was an easier one to execute short term. So we took possession of the commissary where the previous operation was, and we proceeded to make frozen and fresh bagels and breads and pastries for 
restaurants and for Cisco food services of the world and U S food service and shamrock and all those guys, we were selling to whole foods and wild oats and, you know, grew to a couple million dollar business. And then I sold that to him and then came back to my roots, which takes us to your question. See, I'm very long winded. Mm -hmm. Uh, The question being, so it wasn't like, oh, I'll start an audio book. I knew a lot about audio. So I started to attend publishing events, identifying as an audio book uh, identifying the audiobook market as a place I could participate and re-enter production. And then I started my own podcast, which is something like what you guys are doing here called Small Biz America. And I did a couple 300 episodes interviewing entrepreneurs from all over the place and uh, learned how to podcast. And eventually that led to me producing other people's podcasts. And so about six years ago, I was, I just had too much work that I could handle myself. And it was time for me to step back and bring in a team to do the production and transition to being more of the leader and the CEO. So today it's really a lot more about the team and the culture and um, the strategy than it is about actually producing audio. Other people are doing that now. And it's very satisfying to have an impact on my team's life. So I probably answered a few of the questions you were going to ask me anyway, but that's how these things go. I've done a lot of interviews. No, it's good. No, it's good. It's good. And by the way, where in Chicago are you from? Because I'm also grew up in the Chicago suburbs. Oh, all right. Yeah. I grew up in Skokie. Okay. I grew up in uh, Buffalo Grove. So not too far Northwest suburbs. Absolutely. Same. Yeah. Yeah. You're right there. Awesome. So in, in terms of what you're doing now, I feel like it's always this kind of joke that everybody's got a podcast, right? So I'm yeah. sure that, you know, in terms of like who you're working with, is it like, you know, I, I'm sure it's grown. I mean, as you've gotten more into the podcast, it's more and more people are creating podcasts. So what does that look like for your business? I mean, is it industry specific? I mean, are there certain you know, influential people that like, you want to work with? Or yeah, That's a great question. So I built the business really with the business podcaster in mind. So what I mean by that is the core has traditionally been uh, 20 to 30 minute shows with an interview guest. Uh, and we're genre agnostic. So we've done shows for uh, people in the insurance business, in the real estate business, in uh, we've done shows with uh, nonprofits in the food space or uh, uh, macular degeneration in the low vision space. Uh, we have um, cloud computing. I think I said real estate. Um, so it's really some authors end up becoming podcasters because, you know, we've got that audiobook side that sometimes yeah, yeah, feeds yeah. into. And then a few that are a little more local and more hobby-esque. But most of them have been, uh, we're in the literary space too. We have a very successful show called Friends in Fiction, which is four ladies drinking wine, talking about their New York, New York Times bestsellers, that, sellers that they have written. They're all Simon & Schuster uh, publishers, so... Uh, authors with that publishing. So um, so it's widely varied. And most of the time, the types of businesses that engage us are looking to up-level their brand and have a, a platform from which they can build their business using podcasting as a content marketing strategy. Makes sense. So in terms of, I mean, so, so it seems like most of your clientele are B, like in the B2B space, right? So it, it, like, I mean, I guess if you looked at, yeah. are you considering working with influencers? Because I feel like, you know, or like even and professional at, at, um, athletes, you have these like NBA, NFL players that like you know they have some free time. And they start these podcasts while they're on the road interviewing you know opponents, right. teammates. So right. have you looked into maybe you know working with people that have this higher reach and helping them? I guess, reach more people. It seems like you're working with more kind of like SMBs per se right now, if that's correct. Yeah, I think that's probably true traditionally. And it's interesting you ask the question and frame it that way because we are legging into larger, some of the you know larger businesses, which is a little bit not exactly what you're saying there. But we have been uh, speaking with um, higher, higher visibility people. Uh, well, for example, we produce all the Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad uh, shows. Wow, okay, and, that's we're building, cool. and we're building a network with them. So that's probably the most you know obvious example of stepping into a more you know this guy is generating 13 million streams a year with his yeah, podcast. He's great. So we're, we're producing it we help facilitate the monetization of the show through advertising uh, we have a partnership uh, with ad uh, advertise cast and um and then so uh and spreaker for the programmatic and so we're we're we have been legging into higher profile people with the ability to monetize the show meaningfully through advertising um we also have and i didn't mention this earlier aside from our core business we have in development, I have a board here, about six shows in true crime, a couple of music shows, uh, one that's about uh, the golden age of Hollywood and letters that were written during that stage. 
And so for these shows, these are, we're investors in them. We're developing and incubating original series, if you like, with the idea that we may exit from them or, you know, uh, or grow the audience organically. But, but these are starting to step into more of a celebrity space. Like, for example, if you look up uh, Stories in the Room, Michael Jackson's Thriller album, which is wild, widely available, also wildly, but widely available on YouTube and all the rest. Uh, we've got about uh, approaching 60 episodes of that. And these are conversations with the guys that made the album with Michael, the actual players that were on the record. So singers and players and um, synthesizer programmers and such. So it's a niche, it's a music, but uh, but it's fairly high profile just because of the Jackson name and because of the, the stature of these players that were on there. Guys like Fred, uh, uh, Greg Thillen Gaines, who you'll see him, he's the keyboard player on the Grammy Awards, for example, you know, that kind of people, those with Stevie Wonder next to him, you know, that sort of stuff. So there's some celebrityness to that show. And so I think we're slowly finding our way into that because we're 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 kind of positioned as a premium company. We're not the, the least expensive way to get a podcast produced. So not everybody's right for us. We're very attentive, white glove engaged. We really help folks develop the show, the listener experience, the graphics, the intros, the outros. So it's a it's it's um you know we're not a DIY or a click to buy kind of solution. Well, actually, um, Robert Kiyosaki, we you know do you reshare like um, lots of that content. On our, I'm not sure if it's like from his podcast, but just you know clips of him speaking on right. our pages and it's like we actually oh. have one that sort of like went viral uh oh i guess like for our sake you know about ten thousand views the other day so yeah that's you know, a big yeah. one man Ten thousand yeah. is a lot of yeah it's he's he's an amazing and you know he's in season now because of the re- the environment we're in uh, with the uh the headwinds with the recession and the uh the the gradual erosion of the dollar and the value of the dollar so even yeah, though he's right great, now he's yeah. on the uprise, but yeah, he's yeah he's got a very interesting uh, persona as well. We produce Kim's show. He's got a couple of others coming on the network now. A guy named John McGregor and uh, others. So yes, that's been a, a wonderful relationship. It's a really nice team to work with too. Awesome, awesome. So in terms of what you do currently, what would yeah. you say like the role of technology is in your business? Ooh, so that's a pregnant question. So at the core, when I started this business, I was still using Skype to produce audiobooks and podcasts, right? So remember Skype? It had the little recorder. I don't know if you guys remember this. So it wasn't great audio. It was, you know, and what, so over time, obviously startups like Squadcast and Riverside and uh, Zencaster and the like have popped up understanding that the world needed a solution for a higher quality recorded product, audio initially, then video adding, right? Because we're all doing video now. And so we use technologies that we don't own, but these are platforms that we subscribe to on an enterprise level and we make them available to our production team to record, edit, and produce our uh, um, our, our clients' shows. Uh, and on the audiobook side as well, we use Squadcast to do audiobooks as well because it's doing client-side recording, high-quality audio and video if it's needed, and, uh, and then into post-production. So on the post-production side, we have a team of folks that edit, and they're using a variety of different platforms, ranging from uh, for edit for editing video. It could be Premiere Pro, Avid. On the audio side, which is a little more core to our business, um, it could be anything from Ableton to Digital Performer to Pro Tools uh, and all the rest. Um, maybe some of our guys are using Audacity, although I don't think so. I think they're probably using Pro Tools or more professional stuff. We don't really care. We're not centralized with our platforms. We're we we're a, we have a core team structurally we have a core team of leadership and then we're using freelance editors and audio professionals to record edit and produce and many of them are sort of they're core to our team but they're freelance guys and they have their own rigs their own setups their own studios they do it their own way as long as they deliver for us uh to our spec we're we're happy so on the AI side of things, there's a lot of developments there. I don't know if you guys were podcast movement, but our COO was there. Uh, mostly where we're applying AI is on the back end of our process. So having said that, we so there are tools in the back end that really help, like those that generate show notes or show descriptions or tw- tweets uh, or Xs or whatever you call these new things. And, uh, you know, so, so we're using technology kind of for the textual uh, transcription and editing side of the podcast part of our business. On the audiobook side, there's a lot of voice tech out there, text to voice solutions, and some of them are quite good. Uh, we rather like uh, Speech Key, and there are a couple others that are very powerful, and we have um, agreements in place to, with them and others to use their technology. But the interesting thing about this is, and we've been looking at a potential go-to-market with audiobooks generated with AI, and we're not getting a lot of uptake on the marketing, on the consumer side. We're just, you know, we'll talk about it a little bit, but it, most people 
people either want to narrate themselves, which we do about 60% of our audiobook business, and the other side of the, and or we're casting. We have a casting team in New York that does that for us where we're using real actors. But we're very much, you know, um, uh, what's the word? Ear to the tracks on all things AI. And I think eventually there's a place where where the, the, the quality of AI's ability to do voicing gets good enough where you really can't tell. And then the thing really disruptively explodes. And I know that Google and Apple, among others, are going to be right there with their solutions. And there's always this risk that they, they could highly disrupt all of the rest of us that hire real people to do this stuff. So fasten your seatbelts. <laughs> no, yeah, I 100%. And I think that to your point, that in terms of AI, it's like, imagine if you have like, you know, like you mentioned, you know, Robert Kiyosaki, right? He wouldn't have right. to go and like re-record it because you might have like clips of like him saying all these different words they said in the past that you have on on, like, on a record and you can pull it together and, and create like one audio book, right? Yeah, that's possible to do. In fact, we've contemplated creating a short format series with a, with a modeling voice of Robert's uh, and literally writing for the series. So that's an interesting application of AI where where you've got a guy that may not have time to do all these recordings, but we can actually take his content and have him say it. So uh, something like that. So that's something like what I think you just suggested. Yours was slightly different where, yes, you could edit from different sources and then create a book uh, from uh, multiple sources of audio. Yeah. So there's different ways to think and connect the dots on this stuff. Yeah, definitely. No, no exactly. So I, I, I guess just, you know, in terms of, you know, running this business, what would you say is yeah. the one biggest piece of advice that you wish you knew before you started out? Oh, wow. That's great. Well, you know, fortunately, this one has gone really well. Previous, like the bagel business wasn't as easy. It was, a, that was more challenging and I could point to more things I wish I knew. Maybe that's the place I should go. The current business, Autovita, is really, it's been relatively free of trauma drama, trauma, and headaches in terms of what I'll say about it that I'm glad I knew or didn't know is that sometimes the right people get on the Jim Collins bus, like the flywheel right away. Like I, one thing I would tell you that we, the five of us, we call our management team, the fab five, we, we, we pinch ourselves because it was so effortless to form this initial team. And a lot of companies I think struggle with trying to find the right people. You know, they might have a founder and a co-founder, but then where do you go from there to get the right people? And it's just hard to get that chemistry, right? But we've got an assembly of, of just spectacular people, all with different ways of thinking of it, but with shared values. So that's a really important thing uh, advisory-wise to let know. Uh, my previous business in the food space, what I wish I had known, I really uh, very, very deeply uh, underestimated my personal financial risk in venturing out to do this. I underestimated the effects of doing a family business and the stresses that would put on the entire operation and ourselves. I think I'm much better at managing financials now than I was when I did that endeavor. So, you know, it's, it's like a snowball that rolls along along the way and you learn things. And I'm not sorry I did any of it, although it was a little painful uh, with the bagel side. But it prepared me well because we had about 30 employees and I learned, you know, I went from reading music scores to reading P&Ls and balance sheets and dealing with financial people. So that equipped me for the next stage of my career, which is what I'm in now. So I hope that's helpful. It's not exactly the question you asked. It's No, it's good. Yeah, definitely. So if, you know, if we're going to have this conversation again in one yeah. year from now, where do you expect things to go for your business? Okay. So right now I'm creating a, uh, I'm looking to pull back from the day to day in Autovita Studios. Um, we have a team that really is autonomously running to coin an Elon, well, just, you know, uh, to coin a driver uh, metaphor. It's it's running itself it, with the exception of the sales process, which we are now looking to bring in other people that understand our product, can really manage a team of salespeople. So in a year, I hope to have two or three people in place that are selling the audiobooks and podcasts under the direction of a sales manager. I, I hope that our billings, which are currently running around 1.2 million or, you know, maybe add 500 to that or more. So there's that, there's the top line revenue. I'd like to, uh, our expenses and our infrastructure costs to be proportionately higher than they are now, uh, which is just naturally pump more sales into an infrastructure and you're going to get higher, uh, 
you know, EBITDA. And then I'm also creating uh, what I'll call a superstructure and uh, exploring raising capital to bring it in to help fund some of the Audavita original podcast series, incubate more shows and sell those shows. And we're also, that's bringing us into television and film a little bit too, because some of the partners that we're working on these podcasts with are also filmmakers. So I think that it's going to be a broader uh, spectrum of projects, uh, more people in the room and uh, higher excuse me, higher revenues all the way around. So if somebody watching this wanted to reach out to you, do you mind sharing your website or the best way to oh, get in Oh, absolutely. I'm, a, I'm, I'm delighted to. So uh, if you're an author or a speaker or an aspiring podcaster, we'd love to talk to you to see if we can help. And there's a fit. Audivita.com, www.audivita. It's like Audi, the car, Vita, the sound of life. That's uh, the website. And you can find testimonials and samples of our work and all, you know, all the things you would imagine. My email is dwolf. My first initial and wolf like the animal at audavita.com. And thank you for that. Yeah, of course. And thank you, David. Thank you both. Great, great to be with you.